should be attracted by this inspiring cult, the ancient Jews, and seek to share in the fellowship and promise of this ancient cult? Isn't it odd? Why was that? Why were so many people drawn to this idea of an invisible God that could not be shattered in a temple built by man's hands? And what happened next? After the fall of Tyre, Sidon, Carthage, and the Spanish Phoenician cities, the Phoenicians suddenly vanished from history. And as suddenly, we find not simply in Jerusalem, but in Spain, Africa, Egypt, Arabia, and the East, wherever the Phoenicians had set their feet, communities of Jews, and they were all tied together by the Bible and by the reading of the Bible. Jerusalem was from the beginning only their nominal capital. The real capital of the Jews was the Bible. It was not a city. The capital of the Jewish people was the Bible, not a city. And that's something new in history. It is very new in history. But unfortunately for those of you who think it's unique, it's not. The seeds were sown long before when the Sumerians and Egyptians began to turn their hieroglyphics into writing. You'll have to study that to see that many of the customs of the Jewish people are actually ancient Egyptian customs. If you're Jewish and you have a, menor, um, 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 a mezuzah on your doorpost, you know those little slanted uh, things that Jewish people put on their doorposts in which there's a scroll? That's an Egyptian custom. I know Jewish people don't want to accept it, but it was an Egyptian custom. But that's irrelevant. What's relevant is we go on. So the Jews and the people around them somehow became the same. A new kind of community emerged. And then something happened. Something really important happened. And that was the prophets. Who were the prophets? Where did they come from? What did they believe in? How did they shape the world? And what did the ancient prophets have to do with today's world? Moreover, why would a man like Barack Hussein Obama go against the will of the American people, both parties of Congress, and use political maneuvering to line up with the equivalent of the ancient evil Iranian King Haman. Has Obama become the new King Haman himself? Well, don't ask Harvey Weinstein. He doesn't even know who Haman is. I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Of course. The talking about is Israel the real problem? Should the U U.S. continue to support Israel? And for almost an hour now, I've given you the history of the Jewish people. Time for one quick question. Fire away, line six, Mike, ABC. What's your question? I actually had two, two questions, but all right, whatever. Um, how, how come Israel is allowed to have one of the biggest nuclear arsenals in the world and no one else is allowed around them? Has Israel ever threatened to annihilate a people on the planet, to wipe a people off the planet? No, but what, what do they need it for? Well, there's your answer. It's a defensive weapon. The same reason people are allowed to have weapons in America under the Second Amendment. But Iran has said that when they get the nuclear weapon, they will wipe Israel off the planet. So that your answer is simple. That's why Iran must never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Because I believe the Iranians are telling the truth. I don't think they're lying. Does that answer your question? Oh, okay. And yeah, have a nice day. I'm sure the Bund meeting starts in a few minutes somewhere in Brooklyn in a basement with the flags and the rotating uh, wall with the, with the Nazi memorabilia on it. And you can worship Khomeini in the basements of Brooklyn. You can worship Khomeini. You can go to Syria and join ISIS and rape an eight-year-old girl and then call yourself a devout Muslim. Anything's possible in this world. So Israel's had nuclear weapons. They say hundreds of them. Never heard them threaten to wipe anyone off the planet. Never heard them say they're going to wipe any people off the planet and commit genocide. But Obama's friends in Iran have promised that as recently as, uh, I think, yesterday that they will wipe Israel off the planet, and he's going ahead anyway. Democrats say no, Republicans say no, but there's money in it, so Feinstein said yes. Trace the money. See what Feinstein might be making from it. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage.
Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. They take our money, they make us look like fools, and now they're back to being who they really are. They don't want Israel to survive. They will not let Israel survive with incompetent leadership like we have right now. Israel will not survive. Israel will not exist in 25 years. Think of that. That's Donald Trump today, actually just an hour or so ago in Washington in a rally to stop the Iran deal, which is a moot point because um, Obama has outmaneuvered everyone because he doesn't believe in the parliament, in the, the system of government that has given him so much. Obama has a more tribal view of government, which is that he's the king, he's the raw boss, he's the ruler, and by any means necessary, he will ri- override the people, he'll override the parties, he'll override the Supreme Court, he'll override the Constitution, because he fundamentally has a contempt for our way of governance. Now, we're going back to the fundamental question of Israel again. Is Israel America's problem? Should the U.S. continue to support Israel and why? Is Israel the real problem in the world? Many of you children who've come through the American educational system have the mistaken notion that if only the Arabs were allowed to have Israel, there'd be no problems in the world. And that's because you have no, no sense of what's going on in the world. You know nothing about the other conflicts between Muslims and their neighbors. Kashmir, China, Russia, Philippines, wherever you turn, there's a problem between Muslims and their neighbors. The only one we know of is Israel because the American left has made it the only problem you shall know of. And now to the forefront come the Jew haters, the Iranians. And the problem here is that the Iranian leadership that could have made peace with the world, such as was made in ancient Israel by Cyrus the Persian with uh, Solomon, don't, don't exist. Those Iranians have been killed or thrown into exile by these fanatical Neolithic throwbacks running Iran who Obama seems to love. Why Obama, the great educated man, would like Neolithic throwback Muslims, I cannot understand. Why doesn't he side with educated Muslims such as the King of Jordan? Why doesn't he side with educated, good leaders such as the leader of Egypt, the general? Why does he side with these Neolithic throwbacks of Iran? And why do so many American politicians such as Dianne Feinstein side suddenly with this Iran deal even though they're Jewish? Well, you'll have to do some investigation. When there's $150 billion about to flow back to Iran and companies are tripping over themselves to do deals with these monsters, you have to figure there's money there. And if there's money there, well, there's some U.S. senators there and some congressmen there. Well, not directly, of course. Not directly through shell companies, front companies, relatives, in my estimation. That's what you have in the United States of America today, in my estimation, in my opinion. Now you understand why suddenly people of Jewish descent would suddenly back, even a guy like Schumer, as liberal as he is, understood it would be the death of Israel to do this deal. Not Feinstein, though. Why? I smell money. So let's go to some of the callers. Is Israel um, the real problem? Should the U.S. continue to support Israel and why? Again, if you missed the first hour, I can't repeat it. But I began with who the Jewish people were. I talked about the Babylonian captivity. I talked about Hiram. I talked about the land of the Hebrews. I talked about who the Jews were before they were taken into captivity in Babylon. And I talked about the five books of Moses and how they were ruled in the past, the ancient past. And then I talked about the emergence of the prophets where I left off and who they were. And the prophets marked the appearance of new and remarkable forces in the development of human, of human history and who they were and what they did for the world. Now, many of you uh, believe that the Bible is the word of man, not of God. Many of you believe it's the word of God, not man. It's almost irrelevant. 
The prophets, such as Ezekiel, for example, came from different backgrounds. Ezekiel was one of the prophets, and he came from the priestly caste, while the prophet Amos was a shepherd. But they all had something in common, and they all gave allegiance to no one but to the God of righteousness, and they also were able to speak directly to the people. Now, I want to pause right there. Isn't that exactly what we, the people in America, are praying to find in a leader? Someone who speaks of righteousness and can speak directly to us, as opposed to that false Harridan, Hillary Clinton, for example. Do you think Hillary Clinton gives allegiance to the God of truth and righteousness? And do you really tell me that Hillary Clinton speaks directly to the people? No, she's not of the prophet class. She is of the most cynical class, which is why she is hated. And so the prophets gave allegiance to no one but to the God of truth, righteousness, and they spoke directly to the people. They were like the talk show hosts of their day. I'm not pulling your leg on that. We speak directly to you, or we wouldn't be on the air. I wouldn't be on the air 20 some odd years if I didn't reach you. Whether you agree with me or not is irrelevant. I'm touching you. I'm reaching you, and I'm making you think. And so I speak directly to the people every day. In that sense, I have a bit of the prophet, the prophet in me. Do I speak only to the God of righteousness? No, because I'm an ordinary man. I'm not a prophet. There are talk show hosts who pretend to speak only to the God of righteousness, but they have their eye on the cash register. Never forget the Kaching. But the ancient prophets gave the word of, the, of God, and their formula was simple. The, the word of God came to me, and they call it the word of the Lord came unto me. If you read the Old Testament, it's always the word the Lord. And I have to translate that when I'm reading the Old Testament, because I don't like the word Lord. I, I, re, I, re, I reject the whole concept of Lord, someone lording over me. That, that, so if I read the Holy Scriptures, which I do from time to time, and I read, the Lord said unto Joshua, fear them not, I translated, God said unto Joshua. I don't like the word Lord. I don't live in England. I don't like English lords, and I don't like the idea of Lord. I like the idea of God. My own, so I'm just giving a personal viewpoint. And so what did some of the things the prophets say? Well, for one, they were very political. They exhorted the people against Egypt. They kept attacking Egypt. They attacked Assyria. They attacked Babylon. They put down the indolence of the priestly order of, or, the, or the flagrant sins of the king. And some of them, some of them actually became what we call socialists today. They were into social reform. They said that the rich were grinding the faces of the poor. The luxurious were consuming the children's bread. Wealthy people made friends with and imitated the splendors and vices of foreigners. And they said that this is hateful to Jehovah, the God of Abraham, who would punish this land for doing this. And they wrote these down. They wrote down these diatribes against the rich and against uh, the other nations, and they preserved them and studied them. And wherever the Jews went, they spread this new religious spirit. They carried the common man uh, past the priest in the temple, past court and king, and brought the common man face to face with the rule of righteousness. And that's the importance of the Jews in the world. You understand that? Is to bring the average man face to face with the rule of righteousness, whether you believe in God or not, is, is irrelevant. At least you know what righteousness is. So you could be an atheist and be addicted to the concept of righteousness, and it could animate you. Righteousness or truth could, could animate you day and night. And you could hate Hillary Clinton and be a liberal because you know she's a liar. You also know that she's a phony and you know that the, that the nation could not, will not survive another eight years of them. See, that's the important thing. But remember this, it was that in the, in the supreme utterances of Isaiah that the prophetic voice came up to a, uh, a whole new era because they foreshadowed the whole earth united and at peace under one God. That's the message of the Bible. By the way, it's not a message of war and dissent. The ultimate message of the Bible is a belief that the entire earth will be united and at peace under one God. Do you understand that? If you really read the Old Testament, you'll find that. You may not find it in individual complaints and this and that, but you'll find it there. So if you read the Old Testament, you'll find a lot of hate in them. You'll find prejudice. You'll find evil. You'll find stuff that reminds you of the propaganda uh, 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 of, 
of some of the worst regimes in history. 